So welcome everybody. Today I'm going to be doing a presentation on factors contributing to acute and chronic asthma. Uh, my name is Kenny Miller. I'm a clinical educator and I've worked as a respiratory therapist for the last almost 450 years. Now I'm in my 49th year and um, I've, I've worked mostly in the critical care environment. Uh, but I've had a lot of interactions and a lot of work with the asthmatic patient population. So today our learning objectives are going to be describe the difference between what's acute and chronic asthma, uh, review the factors that can contribute to acute asthma, to find the factors that can contribute to chronic asthma, and then describe some different methodologies to prevent these contributing factors to cause an acute attack or to uh, have chronic asthma. So talk about some of the interventions that we can do and some of the um, steps the patient can do also to try to help prevent an acute asthma attack or to uh, develop chronic uh, a rehabilitating asthma. So when I talk about chronic asthma, that's going to really be relating to patients that don't have good asthma control. You know, they have asthma, uh, but it's not well controlled. So asthma is a common chronic disease that's, that is suffered by about 300 million people around the world. Uh, it's a severe inflammatory problem. One of the things that asthmatics really struggle with is that when they don't have symptoms, they don't think they have asthma. And one of the problems is that asthma, even when it's asymptomatic, is still causing inflammation into the airways. And if that inflammation is not addressed in a timely manner, or that inflammation is um, maintained to a point that it doesn't, you know, allow to exacerbate, um, you know, those patients a lot of times think they don't need to take medications or they feel that, you know, they don't have to be away from triggers and that because they're feeling good. So again, you know, that it causes dyspnea, wheezing, and a whole matrix of other symptoms. Uh, in the U.S. alone, according to the National Library of Medicine, there's almost 12 million people in the United States suffer from this disease. And unfortunately, almost 25% require some form of um, provider intervention. May it be ED visits, um, urgent care visits, or a group will be hospitalized and even a group will go on to um, be admitted to the ICU. And unfortunately, about 5% uh, of these patients will go on and die. So the as exacerbation of asthma can be mainly two types, acute asthma, which can be a life-threatening asthma attack, or chronic, which is a worsening of the chronic condition and exacerbation. We see that in COPD, where COPD patients are often stabilized, but unfortunately, you know, they'll get sick or they'll get exposed to some kind of irritant or start smoking cigarettes, and they'll develop a, an exacerbation. So risk factors in developing asthma. So when we look at individuals that have asthma, why, you know, why do they have asthma? Well, uh, a, his a family history is very, very significant. If your mom or dad has asthma uh, and you're born, you know, you're a child, you have a higher propensity, okay? Um, a large amount of viral respiratory infections, okay? Someone who gets sick year after year after year, can have some airway remodeling that starts developing into asthma-like in uh, symptoms and chronic inflammation. Exposure to allergens, chemicals, or smoke. So if you work in certain occupations, you are more likely to possibly develop asthma. Um, sex, age, race, and ethnicity. In the sense, I know African-Americans, males have a high propensity towards asthma and Females have a tendency to get asthma later in life, especially postmenopausal, and at birth, more males have asthma than females. And if you just, you know, you've had uh, eczema, you know, skin inflammation, hay fever, uh, sinusitis, uh, they have plays a role. And we find out today that obesity is a major contributor to asthma because of the chronic inflammatory process that 
adipose tissue puts on the, on the body. So when we look at occupational hazards or exposures, you know, there's a whole plethora of different type of occupations that can lead to the development of asthma. Uh, bakers, individuals working in grain milling or, you know, processing or milling, uh, drug or detergent manufacturers. Now you can, you know, you know, usually uh, detergents are very scent-like and can be very irritating to the airway. Um, farming or work with laboratory animals, especially those animals that have a lot of danders like cats, dogs, or um, large animals like a yak. Um, and working with plastics and metal, the little fibers can be very irritating to the airway as they're being either burned down or reshaped. And then obviously woodwork, and especially if you're working with some of the hard woods or um, fragrant woods like cedar, oak, um, walnut, they can be very irritating to the airways. I know myself, uh, I did a lot of woodworking through my years and uh, oak always seemed to cause me to have um, irritation in the airways. I always, always made sure I wore a mask if I was going to do any kind of plane in or cut in um, with, with oak. Out on the outside, doing it for firewood doesn't seem as bad. And here's another list of causes of occupational asthma. And you can see some of these are what I talked about. But those that make antibiotics, uh, tea dust out in, you know, into third world countries, fish products, especially if you're doing things like shrimp, lobster, <clears throat> those type of, um, you know, type of uh, animals can cause problems. So you can see there's a whole problem, you know, there's a whole list of in, you know, type of occupations that can facilitate the development of asthma. Now, also, there's certain childhood conditions. So if, you know, you're a baby and you're born cream term prematurely, or you have very low birth weight or required mechanical ventilator, ventilation um, at right after birth, uh, that has a much higher level of asthma compared to those that have a normal birth rate, a normal maturity, and have not required any type of mechanical assistance. So again, you can, you can see that certain children, unfortunately, if they're born to an asthmatic parent, they're premature, uh, they have a history of eczema, hay fever. Uh, it just kind of puts to all of these in a synergistic effect uh, factors to lead to the development of asthma. So acute asthma is defined as shortness of breath or breathlessness increasingly progressively. Uh, it's wheezing or cough and increases ga gradually, uh, feeling tight, uh, chest pain, and if you do a PFT or a, a peak expiratory flow, there's a huge drop. You're talking about at least a 30 to 40% drop. So if my FEV1 is normally at 80%, it may drop down as low as 40%. If my best peak flow is 500, it may only be 250 at this point. So there's a you know, there's symptoms that kind of lead you to believe the patient or the individuals have an, an acute asthma exacerbation, uh, but there's also objective data if you're using peak flow or FEV1 pulmonary function trial studies. Now, acute asthma triggers often occur with dry and cold air, and this has been my uh, propensity to triggers over the years I have asthma. And one of the things I always notice is if we go from a very humid environment to a very dry, cool environment, cold environment. So back, you know, the day is, you know, 70 degrees high humidity and the next day is 50 degrees low humidity. I will feel that in my lungs, okay? That ambient air change I will notice because the relative humidity drops and that cold air and dry air is more irritable to my airways. Uh, upper respiratory infections, that's another one. Uh, I, you know, people that know me know that I'm in very good shape. I exercise a lot. But if I do get the flu or I do get some kind of a respiratory virus, um, I, I will, it will trigger my asthma for sure. Uh, the only time I've ever required oral steroids has been during a, some kind of a viral or bacterial type of event. Allergens, dust, mites, uh, pollen in the air. You know, I try to stay inside or at least not do physical exercise outside if the pollen count is real high. Uh, moles, et cetera, you know, the common allergens. Exercise, cold, cold air-induced exercise can do it. Uh, stress can do it also. 
tobacco smoke or secondhand smoke. Individuals have asthma if they go into a bar and everybody's smoking, that can fuel and trigger off a asthma attack. Danders from cats and dogs, especially those that are very furry and produce a lot of danders. And then there's also a lot of individuals that really don't truly have irritable airways, but their airways get irritated because they have GERD and they're constantly uh, con you know, expectorating acid into their airways and, and, and silently aspirating. And you know, you know, as you know, the pH of acid is very, very low. It's very acidic and it can um, be very irritating to the airway. I mean, you know, that's you vomit on an automobile and it'll take some paint off of it. And that's how acidic uh, your GI crack is. So a lot of times patients are diagnosed with asthma and the asthma is refractory until they figure out what are, you know, what is the trigger that's causing the asthma to kind of be refractory. So again, you can see that, you know, here's secondhand smoke. So even though you don't smoke, the smoke goes out in the atmosphere. All right. And, you know, food, drugs, allergies, uh, and I, I put this one in here too, 10 worst cities for asthma in 2010. And you can see, like, I, I live on the East Coast. I live in Allentown, town, near Allentown, Pennsylvania, which is halfway between New York and Philadelphia on the East Coast. And uh, you can, Richmond, St. Louis, Chaganoa, Tennessee, Knoxville, Milwaukee, Memphis, Tulsa, Philadelphia, where, you know, I live close to Augusta and Atlanta, or the top. 10 worst cities because of the air pollutants there are, the amount of pollen there is, and the amount of asthmatic patients uh, that reside in those areas. You know, those are big urban areas. So when you talk about chronic, okay, is asthma refers to intense condition, the asthma symptoms. This is someone who has inflammation swell the airways due to narrow down of the airways. So this is not a person who just has bronchospasm and may have some hypersecretions. You know, chronic asthma is going to be shown and differentiated from acute asthma with airway remodeling. A lot of times these patients with chronic asthma do not respond to conventional therapies because their airways are not uh, able to respond to uh, bronchodilators because it's not the spasm, it's actually changes in the tissue epithelium that causes this chronic airway narrowing. So they don't respond to your typical beta agonist therapists, therapies. So again, chronic asthma triggers can be respiratory infections like rhinovirus, sanitizing agents, air pollution, strong perfumes, chemical allergens, just like the acute, Corey daily adherence to uh, daily asthma medications. Often patients that have chronic asthma or hard to control asthma, you know, refractory as we call it, is they don't really do their inhalers correctly. They don't use their maintenance drugs like their inhaled corticosteroids correctly because they, again, one may be money, one may, may be education level, or knowledge, or three maybe, because I feel good. Why must I take medication? Uh, stress and anxiety, they're on chronic medications like aspirin or NSAIDs that can cause it, and they have a history of sinusitis, heartburn, acid reflux. So these things are not controlled. So they're constantly having mucus dripping. They're constantly having sa uh, silent aspiration, and these, this is constantly triggering the airways and no longer now just causing bronchospasm and wheezing, but actually causing airway remodeling. So here's another picture of different type of asthma triggers, and you can see smoke, strong emotions. So it doesn't have to be a negative emotion. You could be crying because you're happy your child got married or graduated, or it could be that you're happy you got a real nice bonus at work. So there's, you know, the emotion doesn't have to be a negative emotion. It can be positive too. Uh, furry pets, coals, as I said, coach, uh, cockroaches are very, very um irritating to the airways and asthmatics and can be really a cause of chronic asthma in low social economic groups, uh, areas in the urban um, regions where there's a lot of crowding and things like that. Mold and mildews that build up, strong smells, 
Uh, you can, you know, again, uh, when I first started to work in respiratory, they used to wax the floor, uh, the, the floors with some kind of really, really potent uh, chemical. And God, I came into work one time and went to an asthma attack because of the guy who was buffing the floor. Uh, luckily, they no longer do things like that. They've, you know, we've been got smarter over the period of time. But that scent was very toxic. So here's a nice slide that shows you the difference between acute and chronic asthma. You can see in acute asthma, you have the bronchospasm and you have a narrowing of the airway, okay? You have hyperactivity, mucus hypersecretion, and some eosinophil inflammation and IgE production. But when you look and compare, so right away, that movement is larger. So in the chronic asthmatic patient, you have globid cell metaplasia. So you don't, really have, you don't have just mucus. You have the cells themselves have become fibrotic. The smooth muscle is hydrophied. <clears throat> so that's enlarged. And there's epithelial changes and fibrotic and remodeling. So you can see that here in the acute asthmatic, that airway can respond to bronchodilators and can go back to almost a normal lumen. In the chronic patient, um, the bronchospasm is only part of the problem because you have a, a narrowed lumen to start out with that never returns to a normal airway lumen because of all these different factors here on the right. So you can see that you don't want to get the asthmatic to remodel in airways because they are going to be non, uh, not, you know, they're going to be refractory to traditional medications and they're going to have a lot more of inflammation and a lot more of distress on a daily basis. So with, with the pathophysiology of acute and chronic asthma, you can see where you have in chronic asthma, you actually have changes in the epithelia, changes in the uh, secretion glands that, that are caused. So this is kind of over in this side on the right, this is persistent inflammation and the development of remodeling, okay? Where on the left here in the acute tac, you have your release of uh, inflammatory mediators, your interleukins 3, 4, 13, uh, et cetera, eosinophils, neutrophils. So you have an acute process that causes bronchospasm, but in the chronic, it really ends up causing airway remodeling. Huge difference in one, how the patient's going to respond to therapy, two, how the patient's daily life is going to be. So again, Acute asthma, you have the normal airway, the asthmatic airway, and then during the asthma attack, you can have the tighten of the smooth muscle, bronchospasm, and you have air trapping in the alveoli, causing an auto-peep effect. And you look at, like, here's an example of viral infection that then causes the release of your, these interleukins, and then you also can have allergens that cause the exacerbation, which is going to cause, again, airway obstruction, increased mucus, and hyperactivity. So the airways not only become obstructed, but they're very irritable. So maybe a trigger that normally would not bother them, once they are in an acute state, become more vulnerable to that trigger and become uh, more likely to go into a bronchospastic um, scenario. So again, when you look at the modern view of asthma pathophysiology, okay, we kind of look at really the interleukins. You know, we, we, we worried about mast cells and we worried about dendrite cells and, you know, T cells and eosinophils, but really it's these interleukins that we need to pay attention to because the interleukins uh, cause a nerve activation that causes things like mucus plug-in, Vasal dilatation and obviously the cholinergic reflex that causes bronchospasm. So this is a nice illustration that shows that once an allergen triggers off a cascade of sensitivity into the body, that you can see that you're going to have neutrophils, TH cells, eosinophils that are going to then activate the epithelium, activate the smooth muscle and uh, um, glavia cells and cause airway obstruction in different forms. 
So the effects of chronic asthma now, in the sense, so acute asthma is pretty reversible and is usually short-lived. But um, with chronic asthma, things are different. Exercise intolerance, uh, very seldom can these individuals go out and run. They have trouble going out hiking uh, because they get short of breath whenever they exert themselves. Uh, they can't really push themselves through it because they get too short of breath. They have recurrent infections because they have an increased amount of secretions in the airways, which end up being a medium for bacteria to grow, which then lead to a chance for infections to occur. They have this permanent uh, narrowing of the bronchial tubes. We call that remodeling. Uh, signs and symptoms interfere with sleep. Uh, work and other activities. They have a lot of sick days from work or school during asthma flare-ups. And the inability to participate in daily or social activities lead to depression. A lot of patients that have chronic asthma have a high degree of depression because they can't socialize or they can't interact with their friends or you know go on trips, things like that. And they have fragmented sleep, which leads to, again, um, more chance of infections, more depression, more missed work. And it, it, it's what I call a cascade of doom where one factor leads to another, which causes another factor, which goes back to the first factor. And the poor chronic asthmatic is caught in the middle of this cycle of doom. And again, the phys pathophysiology of chronic asthma shows you how the airways become real, uh, remodeled here where now these airways and the epithelium starts changing and it starts closing the lumen and the lumen is no longer able to respond. It, it, you have a reduced lumen at baseline. So any type of exacerbation makes that reduced lumen even more reduced when you have an acute on top of a chronic um, episode. And again, you know, I put these illustrations in because I think sometimes pictures are worth a thousand Ken words. And you can see that <clears throat> over a period of time, you can see this would be a normal airway. And over a period of time with that remodeling, you now have this is what would be the normal lumen. Because if you look at where my cursor would be here moving, um, down at the bottom here, you can see that there is a lot of scar tissue and fibrotic, fibrotic uh, tissue being formed and the globiate cells hypersecrete and become uh, very fibrotic and also reduces the lumen. So you can see we go from this as being a normal lumen to this as being the chronic remodeled lumen. So Core features of acute asthma, as I've said, is mucus hypersecretion. You have IgE production, hypersecretion, and inflammation in the lung. When you look at the core features of chronic asthma, globiate cell metaplasia, fibrosis remodeling, changes in epithelia and configuration, and smooth muscle hydrophobia. So you can see if I go back again to this slide. Um, I get it, one mommy. Okay, but you can see this is quite different. So you don't have just bronchospasm and um, secretions and low inflammation. You have uh, airway pathophysiology changes. So the primary symptoms of acute asthma is anxiety. You can't breathe. Patients are hyperventilating. If you do get a blood gas, it's usually a respiratory alkalemia with adequate oxygenation. The patient's tachycardic. Um, lung function is reduced, their FEV1 goes down, their peak flow, and um, feeling difficulty in heart rate and breathlessness, meaning that they're dysmic and they also feel like they're really, their heart is pounded. So, I mean, you would try to prevent an acute asthma attack um, in the sense that uh, it's very important for all asthmatics, including somebody like myself, to, 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 uh, monitor and look at the treatment, you know, avoid specific triggers. As I said, if there's a lot of pollen outside or the weather has changed dramatically and it's cold and dry, I try to not exercise or do physical labor outside if I, if I can. Sometimes I have to go out and shovel snow or plow snow or something like that, but I try to, take, I try to make sure that I have a mask on so I can warm up the exhaled air. Foul medication is prescribed. That is so important, and I stress this to all respiratory therapists, is that 
we need to make sure that patients have asthma understand. When they're feeling good, they still have the disease. Make sure they use rescue inhalers, they know how to use it correctly and, and, and keep them clean. Um, there's been studies that show that it takes 10 steps to use an inhaler correctly, especially with a spacer, and sometimes um, almost 80% of the patients cannot do all those steps that are required in order to get the maximum distribution of the medication. Uh, make sure you have the medications. Uh, may, you know, when you're traveling, if you're going to a sporting event, you're going to a concert, something like that, so you have your rescue therapy available. It's not going to do any good if it's out in the car or if it's at, in your bedroom. And then often monitor your breathing. If there's an increase in, you know, dyspnea, wheezing or cough, recommend to see the doctor or visit the ER. We'll talk about asthma action plans in a minute or two because it's very important to know what the good zone is, um, caution zone, and then the red zone. Now, when you look at impending respiratory failure, so if a patient's having an acute asthma attack and the, it starts progressing into what we call a life-threatening asthma attack, maybe status asthmaticus, which we cover in another lecture um, in a sense, but uh, we look at hyperinflation, air trap, and CO2 retention. Hypercar even normal CO2, hypercarbia, is a very ominous sign when it comes to an acute asthma. Because most of the time, as I said, it's respiratory alkalemia is the blood gas. But if they start retaining CO2 and they're breathing 40 times a minute, you know that it's very ineffective dead space ventilation. Loss of consciousness, getting sleepy, so that's a sign of CO2 narcosis. Skin and mucosa turn cyanotic, hypoxia, hypotension which can lead to myocardial infarction, especially if they have a pulses paradoxus where they have so much air trap and that venous return is impeded and thus cardiac output is. And they remain hypoxic or marginally hypoxic despite administered some supplemental oxygen. If the FIO2 requirement is greater than 50%, uh, that is a red flag in asthmatic patients also because it's not a uh, lung parenchyma problem, it is a uh, uh, airway obstruction issue. Uh, here's a picture of a patient in an asthma attack. You can see they're very anxious, they're having trouble breathing, and we have the constricted airway by bronchospasm, smooth muscle constriction, and also increase in hypersecretions. Again, assessing the severity of an acute attack, you know, coughs, soft wheeze, you know, especially it's only on expiratory, minor difficult in breathing, no difficult in speaking in full sentences, considered to be mild, moderate, persistent, and you hear wheezing could be by it could be both on inspiratory and expiratory phase. Uh, the patient looks like they're having trouble breathing, they say they're dysmic, and they're able to speak only in short sentences, maybe say three, four words, versus over in the mild, they were able to say a full sentence. With severe, they're very distressed, anxious, they're using accessory muscles, they're gasping to breathe, they can only say a word here and there, they may be pale and sweaty, and they may be cyanotic. This is a, if we don't intervene at this point, we're going to have, in, we're going to have respiratory failure and emergence intubation and mechanical ventilation. So we want to really try to make sure the patient doesn't get to this point um, if, if we can intervene appropriately. So again, when you look at um, most will have mild respiratory alkalemia, they have a normal PO2, PCO2's decrease in their FEV1 is not perfectly normal, but it's not too bad. But as you start getting into ventilatory um, uh, fatigue, your FEV1 drops because the airways are getting more obstructed. There's uh, CO2 is still down, but now the PO2 started to drop because we don't we have mismatch of ventilation perfusion. And the danger zone is that the CO2 is now normal. I said just before that they're working hard, but they're not blowing off CO2. There's a lot of ineffective dead space ventilation. You're you're now hypoxic. Your FEV1 is down down to about 50% and respiratory failure is that you're hypoxic, you have respiratory acidosis, and your FEV1 is very, very poor. So there's no air movement, there's air trapping, and now you have a, and you have hypoxemia. So you have a medical emergency at this point. So the asthmatic comes in the emergency room, they're there, we have to make sure that we do the appropriate interventions to prevent this escalation to the point where the patient needs ventilatory support.
And this is a nice chart. This is from the Council of Asthma. And it looks again at the, if you look down at the Y axis here, and then up the X axis, top X axis, they talk about mild, moderate, severe, and respiratory rate uh, rest imminent. Uh, this is a very nice um, assessment tool to be used. I, I think this would be beneficial into any emergency room or unit or, or urgent care center that may see an as acute as exacerbation of asthma. And again, it talks about, you know, how the patient feels, how this make, how well they can talk, how alert they are, what their respiratory rate, are they using accessory muscles, are they wheezing? See, again, when you have an absence of wheeze, that is bad. As I've always said, it's better to hear a wheeze than to not have a wheeze at all in an asthmatic. Here, I talked about pulse paradoxus. I mean, if it's greater than 25, you have severe air trap, and, and you're going to have now hemodynamic um, you know, aerodynamic effects because you're going to have that pleural pressure go to the mediastinum and, and block off the great vessels. And then looks at the PCO2 and the SPO2. I mean, again, no asthmatic that has a mild attack should be hypoxic because, again, as I said before, it's not a lung parenchyma, it's an airway disease. Management of acute asthma, uh, inhaled beta agonists, okay, Q2, Q4. Or you can do a continuous infusion. Um, you can look at steroids. They can be given oral if it's a mild to moderate, or if it's if it's more severe IV steroids. Uh, usually a, bur a burst pack. We'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, oxygen. There is some benefit in using high flow nasal cannula oxygen, something like Vapotherm or OptiFlow that you can provide a uh, high liter flow to help stent the obstructed airways, prevent auto peep, and, and get rid of some um, expiratory flow, and thus give the oxygen. Uh, there has been some, some anecdotal studies looking at NIVP, you know, basically BiPAP, and for asthmatics, but the evidence is kind of not robust on that, and it flips-flops depending upon what author and what journal you read. And then in 5% of the patients that have acute asthma will require mechanical ventilation. And again, you know, they may need things like Heliox and might even go on to require VV ECMO if they have a severe status asthmaticus attack. And again, you know, this is a really nice algorithm that, again, looks at acute asthma and determines the management. So if there's an improvement, the patient can, go, you know, be discharged. If they're not approved, not improving, it determines if they should go to the ICU or if they should go to a med surge unit or just stay in the ER for 24 hours. So almost all emergency rooms should have some kind of systematic way of determining how to, you know, how to one, assess uh, the severity of asthma, and two, how to manage that severity, and then figure out if the patient is progressing uh, in the terms of getting better, or are they escalating in the terms of deterioration. So again, this is a very nice one in the sense of talking about, you know, features of high risk. So if we get a patient in our emergency room, they say they've been intubated for asthma before, a red flag goes up right away. If they've been sick for a while with the asthma, another red flag goes up. So there are certain red flags that immediately uh, tell you that this could be, you know, this could turn into something worse than just a mile. And one of the things we have to understand is any patient that gets a, um, any patient that has asthma has the ability to get into a severe asthmatic attack. So even someone like myself that's well controlled, I could get a, a severe attack, okay? Anybody, any asthmatic patient has the potential of going into stas asthmaticus depending upon the level of the trigger, um, how their body responds to that trigger. It, it's like bee stings. You know, there's individuals that get stung by bees year after year after year and never have a problem. And then in the 10th year, bingo. They're in antiphylactic shock. So you got to be very, very careful. You can't be egotistic and say, oh, well, you know, my asthma is only minor. I don't have to worry about an acute attack. I've never had to go to an emergency room. Well, you know, again, you know, there's no literature out there to support that. 
because someone's never had an asthma attack, a severe asthma attack, they're not going to have one. But we do know in the literature that there are certain features that if patients have been intubated before or they've required hospitalizations for more than three times in a year, um, things like that, that is definitely in the literature to say that that patient has the potential, a high potential of having a severe asthma attack and may require ICU uh, mechanical ventilation intervention. So when you look at the primary symptoms, so those are kind of the symptoms of acute asthma. When you look at the primary symptoms of chronic asthma, you look at things like feeling tight in the check in the neck and chest muscles and having retraction, retractions, uh, continuous cough. And one of the things you can see in a chronic asthma is it's not controlled and they're kind of always coughing, always coughing, always coughing. They're often very anxious or panic. They're, they're never not short of breath. Almost when you talk to them, it's just what degree of shortness of breath. It's like, you know, some patients that have retractable pain. They're always in pain, but sometimes it's a 7, sometimes it's a 4, and unfortunately sometimes it's a 10. It's the same way with these chronic asthmatics. They're always short of breath. It's just what degree of shortness of breath is there. Uh, they often have wheezing, even when they're talking at rest, you hear them, you'll hear them wheeze, you know, you, you, you know, the kind of individual I'm talking about, they, especially if they laugh, they wheeze, they, you know, they're just sitting there talking, you can hear them wheezing. And then when they do any kind of exertion, uh, obviously the wheezing gets a lot worse or much more noticeable. Uh, a lot of these chronic patients cannot have long conversation because they're just too short of breath and they have too much airway obstruction, and they just can't take enough air in. So like having a chronic asthmatic trying to do a lecture like I'm doing right now would be very difficult because they would have to take breaks or they would have to say a few words and rest. Uh, they couldn't go on and like I am and just keep on talking. They would have to take some interruptions. And um, unfortunately, they just never, if you talk to these patients, they never sleep throughout the whole night. They have fragmented sleep. Often they wake up coughing, gasping for air, especially those that might have GERD also, because it's that reflux that's causing them to go into bronchospasm. But anyway, they'll feel very exhausted during the day because very seldom do they get more than four hours sleep. Some of them, you know, for lack of a better word, kind of, you know, suck on their rescue inhalers. So every four hours they're back on their inhaler because they're having um, symptoms of asthma. Now, this is, you know, we, you, you know, this, we talk about this in other lectures a lot about the classification of asthma. There's intermittent asthma and there's persistent asthma that require daily medication. So, um, you know, depending pair where you are on this type of stepwise assessment. So usually step one and step two are considered to be more uh, acute and maintain uh, chronic. Step three is where you get in a kind of gray area. In this sense, it's more of a, like a little yellow area is, you know, maybe, I don't know what, what you would call that. But when you get to the goal level, step four and step five, this is what we call chronic asthma. This is, this is truly uncontrolled asthma. You're requiring high inhaled corticosteroids. You're, you're requiring multiple doses of oral steroids throughout a year. Uh, you've, you've added things like Leucotrin, um, antagonists, and your symptoms are most days they're walking um, and you have low lung function. So you can see like when you're at step one here, symptoms less than twice a month. So you have asthma, but it's pretty well controlled. But as you go up here, these patients here don't have any control. In step five, you really start now looking at other type of um, interventions like, you know, using biologics, uh, doing uh, thermal uh, thermoplasty. We'll talk about that more in a second. But really step four and step five is really the chronic asthma. And this is from the GINA guidelines of 2020. Um, they just changed in 2022 a little bit, but not that much different. So really the maintenance drug for all asthmatics, including myself, is low dose inhaled corticosteroid and then you add a SABA, okay, you know, as needed as a rescue. And then when you go to step two where I sit, this is where I sit, uh, is I have a low dose inhaled stir uh, cortical steroid with um, a LABA as needed.
So we, you know, when you're talking about treatment of chronic asthma, they're at the daily inhaled high dose of corticosteroid with a lab. So they're, you know, example would be Advair 550 mic, mics. So they're getting the, the, the LABA along with the highest dose of inhaled corticosteroid doing that BID. Some of them will actually do a TID. Often they're on burst pack oral steroids, starting out with 40 milligrams of prednisone and then tapering down to 30, down to 20, 10, and 5. This happens a few times a year. Some patients have trouble getting off of it. They're kind of stuck on the 5 milligram level because when they go from 5 to 0, they have uh, uncontrolled symptoms. Biological therapies, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Treatment of, co of existing comorbidities is very, very important because if they're obese, if they're still smoking, they have GERD, that has to get under control. You have to get what's known as source control because if you don't get source control, you are going to continue to have the same type of exacerbations and the same level of asthma discomfort. Uh, an individual asthma pro action plan that's germane to them, um, really with these type of patients, you can't use this kind of standard action plans because these patients are, as I say, on the uh, left side of the bell-shaped curve. They, they're very, very sick. So you need to really tailor your plan to that patient, okay, and those symptoms the patient has because trying to get to a generic action plan may not be re reasonable. The analogy I would make is trying to normalize a blood gas on a COPD patient, obviously we're not going to blow the CO2 down to 40. That's not possible. That would only lead to airway injury for that patient. Same with asthma, we have to kind of tailor our plans to the peer level of that patient, you know, the individual level, not the actual peer level. Make sure they adhere to medication and trigger, trigger avoidance. Very, very important. Okay. Uh, thermoplasty for every remodeling and frequent provider follow-up. So like I'm seen maybe once every six months by my provider. Uh, these patients probably should be seen at least every other month and maybe a phone call at least monthly in order to see how they're progressing. Because a lot of these patients, it's going to be trial and error on what works for them and controls their refractory, um, on, you know, high level maintenance type of asthma. And when we look at these therapies, so you look at, you know, management modern of chronic asthma, so you look at some pharmacological interventions, and we talked about that the inhaled, high inhaled cortical steroids, oral uh, steroids in the lowest dose. So as I'm saying, some of these patients never get off a of steroid. They're always on five milligrams because you can't get to it, but it's better than 10 or 20. We talk about biological therapies, immunosuppressants, and then, again, treatment of comorbidities, uh, nasal steroids and antihistamines for sinus disease, if they have sinusitis, treatment of anxiety, depression. They have to feel good about themselves in order to be proactive in the management of asthma. If they feel bad about themselves and they're very, you know, exhausted, uh, they're not going to do very well. Uh, try to weight optimize, obviously no smoking. Uh, physiotherapy for dysfunctional breathing, teaching them how to meditate, diaphragmatic breathing, so they have better use of their diaphragm and less use of inefficient secondary accessory muscles of ventilation kind of thing. And then look at um, bone density, because if they're taking steroids for long periods of time, especially in females, it, they have a propensity for osteoporosis. And then, you know, we try again, you, you try to focus on good control, trigger avoidance. We'll talk about bronchotherapy. And then again, follow-up and monitor. This is very, very important. I can't stress this because if, if, if you look at the, and, and you know, there's a good lecture that's done in your series that looks at the social economic effects of asthma, that there's a lot of inequities. So if you don't have finances, the economic stability, you don't have transport, you don't have the understanding or knowledge, or you don't have the family structure to be able to control the asthma, you're just going to have a plethora of problems that are going to be cyclic, and you're never going to get out of this um, chronic uh, situation. Um, you look at biologicals and asthma, and you can see that when you're thinking of about biologics, the idea is to try to prevent these mediators 
that cause asthma that can end up, uh, unfortunately, triggering all kind of attacks and if not controlled will lead to chronic disease. So if you look at the major ones with asthma or interleukin 1722, uh, there's also 23, 4. So 4, 11, 17, 23 seem to be the ones. So a lot of the therapy when it looks at chronic asthmatics is really geared at trying to prevent this cascade effect of these interleukins causing mediators to be released, uh, released that then cause the remodeling of the airway. So when you look at the biologicals available for asthma, there's a large group of them, okay? There's the generic name and then there's the trade name. So Zolar has been around for a while. It binds to the IgE. Okay, so each of these um, biologicals target a different area or maybe similar, uh, but they're, given, they're administered. So you look at the generic name, the trait name, what the actual biologic does, what does it try to prevent. So again, um, duplexin, which is often seen on TV, is it blocks interleukin 4, RA, 4, and 13. Uh, some of them do interleukin 5. And this is the age that is um, recommended. Uh, some of them are going down to two years now, okay? But this was the, the, the data that I got about a year ago. And you can see the route somewhere subcutaneous. There's one that's IV. And then the dosing uh, depends upon the body weight. You see, this is every four weeks, every four weeks, every four weeks for the first through and eight weeks and every other week. So it's pretty intense. And then some can be given in the clinic or at home. Uh, obviously, IV is going to be in the clinic. But it depends on the educational level. It depends on uh, the, the age of the individual, things like that. They can do it at home or not. Now, there's a whole plethora of problems associated with biologicals. Um, you know, they can have a tremendous positivity in the chronic refractory asthmatic, no doubt about it. There's people who they've been started on this and they, it has been a life changer for them. But they're expensive, they increase your chance of infections, uh, they can cause other abnormalities in your, in, in your body, uh, they increase the risk of certain cancers. So they're not without their own problem, but, but cost is probably the biggest, biggest problem is just like you know, drugs for psoriasis, cancer, um, a, a bunch of other different type of uh, Crohn's disease, immunological. You see them on TV all the time because they are game changers, no doubt about it. But, you know, they're not by nine um, interventions and they have they, they own a cornucopia of problems associated with them. Now, one of the things I want to end up with is uh, something that we, we've done at our institution that can be, again, uh, very uh, life-altering and life-changing is something called a bronchial thermoplasty. Uh, bronchial thermoplasty is delivered using something called an ARR system. It's performed in a series of three bronchoscopies, so over a three-month period, the patient will have these bronchoscopies, and uh, each bronchoscopy targets a different area. So they target the right lower lobe and left lower lobe, and then it tires the bilateral upper lobe. So they'll do one session right lower lobe, one session left lower lobe, and then the last session uh, the right and left upper lobes. And each bronchoscopy takes anywhere from 36 the minutes. Uh, typically, we do the 30-minute ones because by breaking them down into smaller segments allows us to um, decrease the risk associated with the uh, irritation of the airways with severe asthma. I mean, again, this is not a benign. You've got to think about we're going to be burning tissues off of irritated airways, so it has a host of problems associated. But there's been some real good interest, and we, I know some patients have done fairly well with bronchial thermoplasty. Um, so the LR system consists of a radio frequency controller and a single-use catheter. The catheter is connected to this controller, and then a grounding pad is placed to the patient to complete the electrical circuit, so prevents the patient from getting, for lack of a better word, burned and electrocuted. And 
it uses a temperature of 65 degrees Celsius for 10 seconds. So that's a pretty high temperature, okay? As you well know, 38 Celsius is body temperature, so it is, it's very high, okay? And it can result into um, five millimeter increments. Uh, you put in a four electro blasket and the bronchoscopists, you know, usually a pretty uh, advanced interventional bronchoscopist will, will, will slowly go down in five millimeter increments. And in this manner, the entire air wall will be treated from distal to proximal without overlap. You don't want to go back to the area you've done, okay? Now, the side effects of this is bronchoconstriction, mucal secretion, uh, minor bleeding related to superficial trauma. Patients should be monitored following the procedure and treated with bronchodilators in the immediate post-procedure set as often needed. So what happens at our institution, they'll come in and they'll do spirometry and they'll get a bronchodilator. And then um, after they leave, they will come back and get spirometry and a bronchodilator. So we'll see to make sure that there's no large reduction in their FEV1, that this has actually caused a increase in airway obstruction and the patient could be at risk for acute airway obstruction, et cetera. So it, it's very important that uh, we monitor these patients after this procedure and, and help facilitate them prior to the procedure. So there's a picture of it clearing out the airway. So this is the ALAR here. So you can see it's this um, radio frequency device that has a basket. And this basket goes in the airways and will burn out that remodeled tissue. And uh, the smooth muscle hopefully will, you know, open up and the patient will be able to breathe. Okay. So again, you know, this is the idea. And... As I said, it's three, it, it's, it's three procedures, okay? So in the first procedure, we're going to do the um, right um, lower lobe, second one, the left lower lobe, and then the right upper and right lower, or I'm sorry, right upper and left upper lobes in order to do it. So it's a three procedure, so there's not overlap in, in the procedure, so you don't you know, do airways accidentally twice and miss other airways. So this is the procedure map, as they call it. Now, I just wanna just touch on finishing up um, natural remedies in uh, chronic asthma. There's a lot of talk that there are other things that can help chronic asthmatics, ginger, honey, garlic. These things have been around since the beginning of mankind, womankind at this point. Uh, garlic, peppermint, figs, turmeric, uh, we know has a lot of anti-inflammatory. A lot of people take it for arthritis, uh, you know, kind of those kind of problems and uh, lemon juice and lemon scents. So, you know, this is, there's nothing wrong with adding this on the arsenal of weaponry in the treatment of asthma. Uh, there are some anecdotal cases. There's not a lot of peer journal type of cases that's, that talk that this is effective. You know, this, the, but there's no harm in, in adding this to this arsenal of, of, of asthma management. I think you just need to be careful and not use this as your only way of treating asthma attacks or chronic asthma because I don't think there's enough literature out there, enough evidence to think, you know, to say that that would be uh, beneficial in any way. Uh, over the long term. So I'd be hesitant to use as my soul. But, I, you know, I, I've used um, homopathic and natural remedies for my asthma. You know, I, I, I take, you know, I like to use honey and I have some, you know, what they call breathe easy teas and stuff like that that I can add at times when I'm not feeling well. But I still use my inhalers and my uh, inhaled corticosteroid. I do not abandon that in lieu of these type of interventions. So we come to summary here, and I, I think when you look at, um, you know, the contributors, facts, you know, factors to asthma, there's many, many responsible. And I think the first thing you have to do is differentiate what's acute asthma and what's chronic asthma. Some of this crossover occurs, there's no doubt about it, that um, you can have, you know, triggers are always going to be in both of the categories. It's just that the triggers in chronic asthma are 
basically cause and remodel of the airway. I think that's the thing to take from this lecture is that in chronic asthma, you have remodel of the airway that is really non-responsive to, to the typical interventions and you have to use more expensive, more, let the word use the word toxic interventions in order to get the same level of relief. And if you don't take care of the chronic asthmatic patient, their quality of life is very, very low because they're always focused on their breathing because they just can't get air, they can't sleep, they can't interact appropriately in life. Uh, acute asthma may be life-threatening. As I said earlier, any asthmatic has the potential of a life-threatening. We call that status asthmaticus. So again, know the warning, warning signs of a severe asthmatic attack because if once it gets to a certain point, if you don't use emergent intervention, you're going to have yourself a real true medical emergency that you're going to have to have a resuscitation to occur. And it can happen quick. You know, children are very resilient, but once they hit to a certain point, they, are, they lose their compensatory uh, abilities rather quickly. It's like falling off of a cliff. As I said, chronic asthma is debilitating and emotionally exhausting. It's a very low quality of life. So, you know, we got to do everything we can as caregivers to make sure that we can... Um, prevent that from happening and help them any way we can. And there is an arsenal of op options when treating both acute and chronic asthma. So, you know, look at the, all the different options that are available. You know, look, we'll look at what, you know, financially can, can suit that patient and what's that patient able to understand and do and what is the less, you know, what, what is the intervention that will cause the least amount in her, of side effects but give the biggest bang for the benefit. That's always very difficult for me, for us as health care providers to figure out what, you know, do do no harm or least harm is, is, is a very overstated term in medicine, but it's very, very important because, you know, let's try to improve the patient's quality of life, but let's not do it with a whole gamut of side effects or high expenses. So, Again, thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I hope you've learned something from it. Uh, I hope you have a better understand of the difference between acute and chronic asthma and what are the contributing factors. Um, again, this is my name, Kenneth Miller. Um, I can be reached at M-I-L-L-5-5-K-N at L-A-L.com. And again, um, you know, thank you, thank you very much. And if you have any questions or thoughts, you know, please, please contact me. Uh, these are the references that I used in this presentation. Uh, this will expand your knowledge on this, uh, on this information. So if you want to learn more about, um, you know, the chronic and acute asthma and contributing factors, uh, the, I say this is a very good, good reference. Again, thank you very much. And all of you take care of yourself.